Great. Well, um, yeah, as um, Janet said, thank you so much for coming out tonight on a rainy night. And I know uh, if there are sports fans in the audience, I think there's an important game on as well. So I won't uh, keep you too late. Greenscapes are beautiful landscapes that protect our water. Um, Greenscapes is also a name for the North Shore Coalition called Greenscapes. Um, we are a partnership at Ipswich River Watershed with Salem Sound Coast Watch, Merrimack River Watershed Council, and Eight Towns and the Great Marsh, which is a committee um, that works through the Mass Bays program with the state. Um, we also have partners in the South Shore. Uh, Greenscapes has been around since 2006, and what it is, is uh, we provide outreach and education services to municipalities. Um, as Janet mentioned, I run our municipal services program at the Watershed Association. So we help um, towns and cities in Essex County work on outreach and education related to water issues. So both water conservation and um, stormwater, water pollution. Those are our two focus um, issues. And Ipswich just joined back into Greenscapes. They were a member um, when the coalition first began. And um, we're really pleased to have um, them back in the coalition. So providing outreach and education, we do an assortment of things. We have a website. We do talks like this. Um, we have mailers and flyers. We um, have some of our materials are in the back here, including a newspaper that has a lot of information that you'll hear tonight. Um, if you're interested in staying informed of Greenscapes and other events like this, there's also a list um, you can sign up for. I just wanted to not forget to mention that. Um, one of the most fun parts of Greenscapes, besides just being in the communities and working with people, is our school program. Um, we're still trying to get it scheduled for Ipswich, but we have a fifth grade curriculum where we go into the classroom and bring our materials um, and have sort of an in-class field trip um, with all the fifth grades. Uh, we've been in some communities. We're now in multiple schools. We've been in three schools in Andover this year. Um, all the schools in Beverly and Salem have all the different elementary schools have Greenscapes program come in. So. Um, we're really looking forward to kicking that off in Ipswich um, this year. There are some pictures of the kids working with that school program. So why is greenscaping important? Um, it's both water quality and water quantity. We want to make sure there's enough clean water for people and for the environment. I thought we'd start with this. Um, what is a watershed? Our friends at Merrimack River <laughs> Watershed Council gave me this slide and I couldn't resist. Not just a shed on water. Um, a watershed is area drained by a river or, or a stream. Um, it's an area of land that drains to a specific point. So when I'm talking with kids, I talk about it like a bowl. So essentially, the top of the watershed is the rim of the bowl. The bottom of the watershed is bottom of the bowl. So our Ipswich River watershed, um, as you know, we have the mouth of the river here in the estuary, um, which is part of the 20,000 acre Great Marsh ecosystem. But the headwaters of the river um, are all the way up in Burlington, Wilmington, and Andover. Um, there's more than 45 tributary streams that feed into the Ipswich River. Um, it covers an area of 155 square miles. Um, and it's, it travels through all or portions of 21 towns, so it's quite a big watershed, actually. Um, and it provides drinking water for 350,000 people and businesses. So some communities drink water from the Ipswich River that are not actually in the watershed, which is, was pretty interesting. When I first learned that, I, was, I found that quite interesting. So in particular, Beverly, Salem, um, all their water comes from the Ips Ipswich River. Unfortunately, we have some impairments or pollution in the Ipswich River watershed, so that's why organizations like Greenscapes are important. Um, we're and watershed groups. This is our work, is to try to improve some of the impairments. 
But I won't spend a lot of time on this. It's sort of a complicated map anyway. But essentially, what I wanted to point out is that the impairments, there are similar impairments across the watershed, but there are also different stretches of river that have different issues in terms of pollution. Ipswich, um, in the mouth of the estuary, our primary concern about pollution is bacteria. Um, we get all the water flowing down the river. Sometimes, as you know, the clam beds get closed because of um, pollution in the river due to stormwater. And stormwater actually is the number one cause of non-point source pollution. So non-point source meaning you don't have one particular origin that you know of. Um, it's across the region or across the municipality. Um, you can't really point at where the pollution's coming from. So the term for all of that is stormwater, which is polluted runoff. Um, and the problem with uh, pollution with stormwater is that we have a lot of impervious surfaces in our county, in our towns, um, and that makes the stormwater runoff faster. Um, and it also means that there's less infiltration into the ground. So there's less of the water going back into the ground where it can be filtered and cleaned before it ends up in our groundwater or in our rivers and streams. So what, what's the problem with runoff? Um, as we mentioned, it's water traveling across impervious surfaces. So it's picking up pollution as it travels. So it's picking up oils from um, car leaks, it's picking up trash, bacteria from dog poop or other things, um, it's picking up sediments, and as it travels, it, you know, as we can see today, you know, at, when you're driving down a hill, you can see the water streaming down the street if it's a paved street. The problem is it's traveling across the surfaces without infiltrating into the ground. Um, I just put want to mention this, this is actually Merrimack River, this um, picture of the news article, but one of the issues in some of our communities is that when there's too much stormwater entering storm, uh, water treatment systems, it actually causes an overflow. And instead of the treatment center being able to treat the water, it actually overflows and dumps into the Merrimack River. And this is a really significant issue. There's a lot of legislation in front of the state trying to um, address the remedies and the reporting requirements related to how uh, water treatment facilities handle this particular issue, which is called combined sewer overflow. You know, why is this a concern? And the concern is when there's natural ground cover, trees, shrubs, plants, uh, certain plants that have longer roots than grass have, those kinds of natural systems and natural ground cover are really good at absorbing the water, infiltrating it, and returning the water, cleaning the water, and returning it back into the aquifer and into the ground. Um, but as the impervious surfaces of our communities increases, it's, we're less able to do that. So you can see that the difference is with the nearly 100% natural cover, there's 50% infiltration of that water back into the ground. When you get closer to 100% impervious cover or pavement, um, you only have 15% of that water infiltrating back into the ground. And unfortunately, um, impervious cover is increasing. Um, there's some statistics. 50,000 acres of forest lost, um, 38,000 acres of land developed, um, transformed from natural ground cover to developed land um, during the time period 2005 to 2013. So impervious cover is increasing and so is annual precipitation. Um, you can see New England's actually a hot spot across the country. The amount of rainfall uh, since 1958 increased 71% and it, projections are actually showing that to continue. Not only will there be more annual precipitation, but there will be more large, quick storms. Again, just put this up from the weather report today. Just today, we're expected to get between one and two inches of rain. And those kinds of storms are projected to be more and more common. And unfortunately, 
those kinds of precipitation are what causes more stormwater in contrast to a light drizzle over a longer period of time. So the state and the, and the federal agencies recognize that this isn't just a problem that municipalities should handle on their own, but they do have regulations that municipalities must adhere to in order to address their stormwater pollution issues. The MS4 is the name of that regulation related to stormwater. So this is what your DPW is working on, is adhering to the MS4 regulations. And one of the parts of that in includes outreach and education, which is why Greenscapes is here to assist those DPW departments. What can we do? What can each of us do? And that's really what I want to spend most of the rest of the presentation talking about today. We can reduce pollutants before they get on the ground. Different strategies for that. Oop the poop. Keep the streets clean of trash. You know, instead of washing your car in your driveway, maybe wash it in an area that's gravel or even grass um, so the water doesn't run off down your driveway and end up in the storm system. We can take advantage of different gray infrastructure systems, detention ponds, filters. We can protect land um, and maintain more natural areas. And we can use green infrastructure, buffers, rain gardens, uh, green roofs. Those are all different approaches individuals and residential dwellings can take to personally make a difference related to stormwater. So part of the issue is our traditional landscape. Lawns actually are not very permeable. They do not infiltrate water very well. The roots of grass are very shallow. So in some cases, rain can just run off grass almost similar to how it would run off down your driveway. Native, Non-native ornamentals often require high water use. Some lawns require chemicals and fertilizers to maintain. It's sort of a monoculture, right? There's, there's not a lot of diversity in our, the turf grasses that we traditionally use on our lawns. So our goal is to really flip that. What we're seeking is less lawn and more what we call a hydrologically functional lot. So more conservation with trees and shrubs, reduced imperviousness. Um, you could try rain gardens, rain barrels to capture rain before it runs off, porous pavement. These are some of the strategies we're going to look a little more closely at. So. In East Coast urban areas, summer lawn irrigation accounts for as much as 65% of household water consumption. Lawn grass is the largest crop grown in the United States. And over 20 years, the estimated costs, maintenance costs of turf grasses exceed those of a meadow or a wetland by 700%. So lawns are complicated, maintenance-heavy systems. There's some misconceptions out there. Irrigation water really doesn't go into the ground, as I already mentioned. Um, it doesn't recharge groundwater. It doesn't replenish our aquifer. In fact, 80% of water applied by irrigation systems can be lost to evapotranspiration or runoff. And part of it is our turf grasses are just not adapted to our climate. What can we do? Here's a picture of a home in Nahant that this used to be lawn. So this is actually, you know, the driveway, I guess, is behind us, and it drains into a lake. So they removed their lawn. These are pervious pavement, and they kept the tree they like that provides shade, and they re replanted much of the lawn with um, plants suitable for rain garden, having deeper roots, more able to absorb the water before it runs off. This is a picture of a home on a lake. Rather than having the lawn all the way down to this path here, we have a richer mix of vegetation. And you can still have a mowed path. You can still maintain your view. But there's the alternative to, to what your shorefront can look like. So in terms of capturing rain and precipitation before it runs off, there are some hard infrastructure approaches, or gray infrastructure, we call that, um, rain barrels, cisterns. We're trying to work on a tour of some of these individual homeowners who have taken this kind of step because I think it seems a little daunting and we'd love to be able to show people how it can be done and really talk about what the, the realities of it are, what the costs, what the maintenance issues are, how does it work. 
they're actually turf grass pavers. So you can have what looks a lot like lawn, but it's actually a pavement under there. It's, it's a surface that's durable, but it's porous. Um, you can have porous asphalt and, again, pavers that look just like any other patio, enabling the rainfall to infiltrate into the ground. So I wanted to mention if you're interested in trying out a rain barrel. Well, thanks to Ipswich Ale, we've had a bunch of barrels donated and they're sitting in our garage. And we have a couple different workshops coming up. This is the next one on May 27th um, with our partners iFarm and Boxford. You can also get rain barrels through your water department. I know the Ipswich Water Department has. I know Corliss and some of the businesses in town. This is a really good deal, and it's really fun to make your own rain barrel. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up. Um, green roofs. We've got one on the other side of Town Hall. Has everyone seen that or been aware of that? So the apartments in the brick building just on the other side of our parking lot next to the river, have a ra there's a rain garden on top of that building. So again, when these buildings were turned, you know, when it, Town Hall moved to these buildings, I think that was one of the, uh, some of you may know better than I, the history of it, but my understanding is that was part of the permitting for these, for town hall being here and the apartments being next door, was to try to address some of the issues related to, you know, increasing the parking lot and more pervious, impervious pavement. Um, it's a really beautiful rain guard on, um, on the roof across the way. We have a, a rain garden, sorry, a, green roof garden on our um, office at County Street. Um, one thing I want to point out is our little entryway there, it's not flat. It's not a flat roof. It's not super, super sloped, but it actually, I never knew before I worked there that a green roof could be on a surface that wasn't absolutely flat. So that's pretty cool too. They're actually more versatile. So my experience is three years now. First year, I don't think anyone did anything on it, and it was beautiful. <laughs> Second year, we sort of noticed a little bit of die-off around the edges. So we had our consultant come over and walk through with us and say, really what you need to do is just cut, take cuttings from some of the sedums, replant them. Take cuttings from some of the sedums, replant them. So we did that work last summer. Um, and I, you know, we'll see how it looks this summer. I think there'll probably be more maintenance. But other than that kind of, um, I mean, it's very low maintenance. Um, I think we probably could spend a little more time up there than we do, sort of making sure this is a very small area, so that, you know, that's a consideration as well. I, it would be an interesting question to find out how the roof across the way is going, because that's a much bigger, and again, maybe some of you know that. So, can, I mean, is something like this doable for just a regular homeowner? Like, if I have a, I mean, if I wanted to put a couple boxes like that on my garage roof, like strawberry plants or something in them for the heck of it, I mean, is that, can I find something like that online and do it, or or not? There are, there are, many, many resources that can help you um, do something like that. I don't have costs for green roofs, but I do have some costs for rain gardens um, in a little bit, so that might give us okay. a good comparison. Um, I think, um, you know, s you would have to look at which kinds of plants. My understanding is it's the plants like sedums and chives that can really do well without watering. Yeah. Something like a strawberry would obviously, you know, require Burn. probably more watering. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't know what the initial startup cost is um, for our green roof either. But, um, but it wasn't significant. I mean, I thought just doing even just doing like a portion, like just having a, a six by six, or just for the kids to. Yeah. See, could be kind of yeah. Um, it's, there, some of the best resources I've seen, the New England Wildflower Society has a lot of resources um, online, as well as National Wildlife Federation, actually. Okay. Okay. And in fact, my son just got a Ranger Rick that was all about <laughs> rain gardens. It was, it was perfect. Um, 
So even, you know, and it's also about, again, I've got a couple of slides, but it's also about the wildlife habitat. You know, you can build a green roof that is really great for butterflies or for birds. So again, I just like this picture because it kind of captures everything together. This is the kind of development or redevelopment that we're trying to encourage municipalities to look at. You know, maybe they're redoing a parking lot downtown. I know Ipswich is looking at Hammett Street um, parking lot and the planning office has been working on some designs there. I know the parking lot here around Town Hall isn't big enough and they've talked about expanding, but if they expand, what kinds of concerns would there be because we're so close to the river here? These are the kinds of solutions and strategies that we're encouraging um, municipalities to look into. This basically is what you can do in your backyard. So a bioretention swale is also a rain garden. So here's some good facts for you. Um, choosing the site, you want to look for a natural runoff spot. Maybe there's a place in your yard that's always wet and it's usually down, down slope maybe. A good size for a rain garden is 100 to 300 square feet. Generally would like it to work as an infiltration system, so you want to think about where is the runoff from your driveway, where is the runoff from your roof. You want to have the slope less than 20%. You want to think about how deep it is as well. You don't want the, the deepest part of the rain garden to be more than six to nine inches um, of where water would pond up. Choosing the materials, you have to do it thoughtfully. There are four layers, gravel at the very bottom, then pea stone, then the different levels of the bioretention soil, sand, topsoil, and compost, and then mulch at the top. The entire depth is no more than two to four feet, um, and it should drain in less than 72 hours. You want to think about what kinds of plants will grow there, and again, there's so many resources about this, but I just wanted to highlight a few different plants um, and what your considerations are when you're choosing the plants. Native plants will obviously do better than non-native because they're more acclimated. And the cost uh, to install on your own, it's pretty reasonable cost. Contractor costs a little bit more. And then back to the maintenance question, it's definitely not no maintenance, but low maintenance. Um, we have rain gardens, again, at our office on County Street. We invite volunteer gardeners to come join us for you know, regular seasonal um, maintenance of our, of our gardens. And I think we have three or four garden days throughout the summer. We never water our rain gardens, and they do bloom through the summer. So again, just the considerations of the, of the plants, there's lots of lists out there, but if you're doing your own research, these are things to think about. You want to think about what parts of your yard are, you know, what the microhabitats are. You can have rain gardens in different microhabitats, but you need to think about what plants you're using. You want to think, as with any garden, about aesthetics. We have a lot of winter holly in our rain gardens. They're beautifully red for, through much of the winter, and the birds love them. Butterfly gardening, wildlife habitat gardening, as I mentioned, National Wildlife Federation has a lot of resources. Native trees, native shrubs. It's all on greenscapes.org, um, but we also have some handouts back here. Um, ground covers, which also can have aesthetic color. You can have grasses. There are lots of native grasses that do better, that are drought tolerant. Even if you're trying to get your lawn, you know, you don't want to get rid of your lawn, you still want to have some green lawn. There are some um, turf grasses that are actually native to New England and require much less irrigation and watering um, through the summer. And there's just lots of beautiful plants. So again, I'll just kind of summarize here, but um, Using these kinds of green landscape designs, it decreases your lawn size, you infiltrate stormwater, you're using native plants which require less water, you can apply little or really no chemical fertilizers, lots of benefits.
There's some examples around the region um, to take a look at. Partridge Berry Place was a low impact development subdivision that's out by Hood Pond. Those were planted with um, some porous pavers and rain gardens, much smaller streets, much smaller driveways when that um, subdivision was permitted. Wilmington has some great projects, but closer to town, you can come take a look at our gardens and our pavement. And those are the resources. So I will stop there. I know a lot of you in the room have great information maybe to share with each other or if there are any other questions. Actually, the UNH Stormwater Center is a really great resource for New England. And there are a number of places on the campus at UNH um, in Durham that uh, they have full parking lots that are built with porous pavers. So you can, you know, th they are sort of, uh, uh, research center so they are actually testing over time to see how long these last and what kind of traffic and there's lots of research being done um, but again we have s most of our little parking areas right in front of our office are porous pavements you can come take a look at it um, as well they just look like regular pavers are they a lot more expensive? Um, I think they I don't have the costs, I, I will say, but I think they can be more expensive, but they, again, the technology is changing um, faster than I can keep up, and they're, they're, the cost is coming down as there are more people sort of getting involved in it, like, like any business. Um, I think even I've heard that the state of New Hampshire is starting to use some porous sort of semi-porous pavement on their exit ramps off of 101. So as they've been sort of repaving those on, you know, whatever capital program they're on, they've been replacing those with a different kind of pavement. So I think it, it really is becoming more and more of a um, possibility that um, public works are looking at. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Again, I... Maybe this is a good segue, Carla. Do you want to talk about something? But I, I'll, I'll introduce you. Um, again, I know the planning office has been working um, to redesign Hammett Street parking lot for many years. And I, I, it's a complicated project because there are multiple owners. It's not just town-owned land. But I really have great visions of the kinds of things they could do with that area there because it does flood now, there's no green space. <laughs> um, and in terms of sort of a, a part of downtown that, you know, isn't beautiful, there's so much that could be improved. So um, so that would be a really fun place to, to look at. And I'm also, um, I don't know, I know there's work on, along the river walk behind EBSCO um, and I think some of the paths there that are being redesigned, they're looking at porous pavement along there as well. Um, so Carla um, has some ideas about downtown Ipswich that we at Ipswich River Watershed have been kind of brainstorming about with Carrie Bates, who works for the recreation department in town as well. Um, and, um, and I'll just pass it over to Carla. <laughs> Um, I don't really know what I was getting myself into, to be perfectly honest. Um, but um, you guys, I can talk to you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, well, I'll just give you. Um, I'm Carla Villa. I live in Ipswich. Um, I actually, for the last three and a half years, I worked at Ipswich Hale. But yesterday was my last day there, and I'm moving on. I'll be working. I'm opening a store downtown, um, so I'll still be downtown. And um, and I've been very involved with the Ipswich Business Roundtable and a lot of the downtown businesses. The nature of my work at the brewery has been to do things like cask and clam and good in the hood. And I'm trying, you know, I was trying to bring back um, some, you know. Like, like the things that Carrie works on. It's like trying to get foot traffic and to get people downtown to enjoy it. Um, we have a charming little downtown and it can be better than it is. Um, so one of the things that I identified was that like the Ipswich Business Roundtable, there was this whole, you know, they wanted to, they, and they got um, fl some flower baskets made um, or you know like like low line, like containers for outside of different storefronts and they were trying to do fl uh, hanging flower baskets and they just kept running into roadblocks red tape whatever you want to call it um, 
And I, you know, I've, I've been working in Brown Square every day for the last few years, and, um, and I, s like, go around and I just see, like, tiny little improvements we could make. Um, and so I've talked to, um, you know, the breweries behind it, uh, uh, Dave who, and his partner Peter who own Napa and a couple other pieces of property in this area. Um, you know, Bob at Bob's Auto, we can talk him into it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and Mark from Tedford's is really, really into the idea. So my concept is just to take every little bit of green um, and try to coordinate plantings, just, you know, so you have like a, a color palette, like the same sort of plantings all throughout Brown Square. To me, this seems like a doable project. Um, not that it's done yet, but you know, here we are talking about it. Um, but uh, what I would like to do is instead of like trying to do something all down Central Street and Market Street and incorporate five different, you know, um, islands at different parts of town, which a lot of them look really nice, like right downtown at uh, Market and Central Street, like that, that's a beautiful island right there. Um, but this just seemed like a small project that could be executed in a summer, you know, in a, in a, in a month or two. Um, so the more I kind of talked about it, I got, um, Somebody, he actually doesn't even live in Ipswich, but he works a lot in Ipswich, and I think he lived in Ipswich once upon a time. Um, but he's a landscaper and also an artist, and he was willing to donate um, some time and some machinery for a weekend to kind of clean some things up. And again, you know, like Dave from Napa, he's like, he's like, I can, you know, they've got lots of gear and strong guys who can rip up the dirt and, uh, and dig some holes for me. So this is still just sort of a loose idea I'm trying to put together. Um, but, you know, I just want to do simple things to make that part of town look better. And like I said, I think it's a, it's a doable project, um, whether it's making some flower boxes. I haven't thought about the environmental impact of it. For me, it was all just like, let's make it look prettier than it is. But I'm glad to know that it sounds like it will be helpful um, Ipswich River Watershed is an organization I've worked a lot with. I live um, right near their headquarters. My back, my backyard looks out um, on on their property, and I'm I'm one house away from the river, so I'm I feel very close and connected to the river, um, which is um, why I work with them when I can on different projects. Um, so I hope that you know, like this summer, I can make some easy improvements um, in Brown Square with the help of other people who are interested in doing the same thing. Which is, you know, I feel like I have the businesses behind me, so that's um, that's a big step. Uh, another project I want to throw into the mix: a beautification project. If anybody you know wants to help me out with this one, um, there's a project in Salem where they've actually taken a lot of the electrical boxes and painted them. Yeah, they've had an artist come in and do, you know, do a mural, make them look pretty. You could do a theme, you could do whatever. Um, there's a number of big electrical boxes in Brown Square, and I would love to bring some art to the area. Um, so, you know, it's simple things like that. It just, you know, needs some time. And I admittedly don't have a ton of time on my hands, but um, I would like to try to sort of chip away at this project. Um, So that's why I got this map. I'll point it out. Also, so, um, it's called Brown Square. Yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you, so right here, it's there. So, so no, that's the thing. There's a tiny little bit here. This house is actually pretty good up there. Yeah. Um, no, that's okay. Um, there's, right here, there's an electrical pole, and there's, um, there's a pretty, I mean, they're not, that's, that's the thing, they're not huge. I mean, it's like this thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, Thank you. 
like a color palette going in, into it. Um, Bob's right here, there's some green. Right here, there's some green. Um, you know, but like Tedford's and, I mean, even the brewery, they have hops all along the front of the building now. And then there's an apartment building, that patio. There's like the patio you can sit on at the brewery. And then you can see that green yard that's for the apartment building. Well, right on the other side of that, that's like a little tiny patch. And they have some pretty plants in there that like Daisy, I don't know, but, um, but again, it's, you know, she, the woman, I think that's actually town property, but I've had these conversations with people at town hall, and they're like, DPW is sort of like, go for it as long as you don't have to be. Um, so I'm just going to sort of fly into the radar. And part of, um, as Carla mentioned, our outreach manager is an artist as well, so she was really excited about this because it is, as you said, it's kind of the urban landscape, but it, some of you may not know that there's actually a brook that is under this northern part of Brown Square. Farley Brook runs from like behind the Cumberland Farm. There's sort of that wet area, and it empties and goes under Hammett Street. It's invisible. It's dark and, and it empties into the river and there's been some pollution issues so it's actually a real opportunity I think to do some cool plannings and thank you um, and have multiple benefits and I, I agree maintenance is always a really important question and concern and I think you know that's the goal is to try to think about um, you know the least maintenance required up front um, and then you, you know there, there are still going to be the need for stewardship and, and, you know, and maintenance down the road.
want to say, um, I go to Tedford's quite often, and I've noticed in the last couple of years, especially the last year, that whole area is taking better care of itself than it used to be. Right yeah. yeah, and I mean, well, you know, I think a big, it's funny, one of my greatest accomplishments at Ipswich Ale was, um, was getting Brown Square paved. Like, it had been on the, like, agenda for the town, but then when I came, when I, like, actually looked at it, they were just going to pave, like, the upper part and right in front of the brewery and not Tedford side. And I was, I said, how does that make any sense? Um, you know, and so because there were no sidewalks involved on that side, it was really easy just to, like, just have the guys, you know, the guys who lay the blacktop just to come through and do it all. So, I mean, you know, slowly, you know, there's a little bit, like, that was, like, one big thing, you know, mm -hmm. that isn't, like, I noticed because I'm like, we need a new street. There's lots of holes, and I want to throw block parties over there. Um, and so I think that was, like, one thing. We're like, oh, okay. And I think that, the you know, uh, Mark and John, who own Tedford's, take, they, have, they run a good business, and they care, and they, they, they want to be a part, you know, they're a part of the community. You know, Ted, like, Mark has, the kids come down from Winthrop and do, uh, Thank you. I just want to thank you all for having me and for, you know, the good projects you're involved in and you keep working on. So.